Uh, my name is Vila Tom Fatisi from College of Population Study, Chulangar University. I would like to welcome you to the afternoon sessions on poverty and social protection system for older persons. Um, poverty, as we all know, a major threat to the well-being of older persons. And in many countries, social protection systems are failing to provide adequate income security to older persons. So in this session, we seek to discuss old age poverty as well as existing anti-poverty policy and program, um, as well as the possible impact of the new measure of aging on the measurement of poverty. So this session lasts from now until 3 p.m. and we have four speakers. Uh, so each speaker will have um, a limit of 15 minutes and there will be a Q&A session after the last presentation. But we can take a few brief questions after each um, presentation. Um, let me introduce you um, our speaker. The first speaker is um, Ms. Dilitina Balinan Buli from Ministry of Women, Children, Poverty Elevation in Fiji. Our second speaker, Dr. Razak um, Jesse from African Population Health and Research Center. And our third speaker is Ms. Vanessa Saimeyer from UNS Health in Bangkok. And our last speaker of this session is Dr. Philip O'Keefe from World Bank. So, um, Ms. Um, uh, Bilicina, you have 15 minutes, and the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and uh, good afternoon. I promise to keep it very short. Um, it's simply a short story of uh, Fiji's um, implementation of uh, social protection programs, particularly on uh, older persons. First and foremost, uh, I wish to acknowledge the organizers, the um, sponsors of the event. Thank you for the opportunity to to include uh, us in the invitation to be part of this uh, two-day uh, meeting. Um, and uh, it's, it's certainly a great opportunity for us to learn and also share uh, what we have back home as well. For those of us that are wondering where the hell is Fiji, uh, you can find it somewhere there. Um, but of course we have two big islands, and one of which has the capital, Suva. Uh, our smallness and social protection, there's some plus and minus to it. I'll tell you in a bit uh, of the detail. In brief, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Fiji, we are still less than a million in terms of population, 884,000 uh, people. Um, this is as per the 2017 census. We have our male and female proportion there. Uh, you know, it probably um, thumbs up to the male that there are probably more than females, but then there's a note at the bottom which says, even though males are high in proportion below the age of 59, a female uh, enjoys a, a longevity, uh, you know, uh, 60 plus. So that in brief is uh, what we want to share. There's so many indicators that we could share with you, but because of the time factor, we really need to zoom down to what is important here. Um, so now let, uh, let me tell you about uh, uh, something a bit more on, on the focus group, which is older persons in Fiji. Um, again, two years ago we had a national census, and for those that are age 60 plus, they're sitting on 18,484, basically 9% of the total population. And then when you look across to persons living with disabilities, they make up 12% of the total population as well. Now, zooming down to social protection and older persons. Um, you know, the story for social protection back in Fiji, though generically started back in the 1920s, and uh, we were fortunate to have been colonized by the British, and uh, you know, there were some colonial hangovers that were very much complemented uh, the way we took off from uh, independence in the 1970s. But there you have a bit of, you know, um, what we have as uh, the timelines. 
but I'd like to draw your attention to the 1920s. Now, it's 2019, um, 90 years on, and uh, you know, I, I, I'll probably share with you what has developed since then. But in terms of the 1920s, uh, social protection uh, generically was inclusive of older persons, the vulnerable older persons. And it was in um, pounds and shillings. Now, that evolved over time, and um, after independence, uh, you know, uh, it evolved into a family assistance scheme where you have a lot of categories that were also, and in, in those categories were also older persons. So still very much generic, but inclusive of older persons. And there you have a picture of, you know, we, over the years, uh, thanks to World Bank and uh, uh, UNDP, they've assisted us in uh, progressive payments where we get to have all those that are coming to line up for vouchers get their bank accounts so that money can come in their bank accounts every month. But, you know, uh, some years back, we, that was the picture of, uh, you know, what payday looked like. You know, men, women, and children queuing up for social assistance or, 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 or whatever sort. Huh? Now, to cut the story short, um, over the last uh, 10 years, there's been some significant political developments back in Fiji that complemented uh, government's uh, development of policies for the aging. Uh, it started off in terms of an interagency committee who then devised a national policy on aging. With that policy on aging, we went to cabinet and we lobbied that uh, perhaps we need a mechanism. Uh, we, we needed uh, legislation to sort of like mandate government to set up a council particularly for older persons, and, and the functionality of their council was really to coordinate uh, the activities that were relevant to implementing the key objectives and activities on aging. So, uh, that's done. The council has been resourced with some money uh, since 2014. But, you know, coming back to social protection, the good news is that we've had great friends. The World Bank came along and uh, reviewed what was already there. Uh, very generic. So after World Bank came along, uh, it, it became a bit more, you know, it was evidence-based, but it, there was a need to go specific. So the outcome was that, of that was that there were two uh, programs um, uh, that the government needed to take on, which is the poverty benefit scheme, which is more household-based instead of the individual-based of, of, of the past. And then we have the social pension scheme for older persons. So the poverty benefit scheme, ladies and gentlemen, household targeted, um, and does not include older persons though, but currently since 2013, you know, five years along the road, we've got about 26,000 families that have been assisted. And, and there's a bit of, um, you know, it's, it can only assist a family with a maximum of four. So if you have 10 family members, we can only go up to four. Now, Social pension scheme, this is a government social protection for older persons. Again, started in 2013, it's pension tested, meaning if you are on some sort of superannuation scheme, then you don't qualify. But it's really for those that have not been on any sort of superannuation. So in terms of age uh, eligibility, it started off at 70 plus. Then we dropped it down to 68, and now currently it's at 65 plus. Coverage at the moment is around 41,000, covering 51.3% of all the persons back home. We also had a, a new scheme uh, that was introduced in uh, last year's budget, which is the Family Insurance Scheme for, that covers government uh, workers, all government workers, and including all welfare recipients under government. Now, all the persons is part of that picture, and in terms of uh, who qualifies, Older persons below 70 years of age covers injury, fire, life. But for those that are 70 and above, they are only eligible for the funeral benefit. Might be a disadvantage, but that's how the policy is being locked in at the moment. Now, bus care assistance, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for, for older persons 60 plus, irrespective of. Uh, um, whether you are earning or not, and you're age 60 plus, you, you get to have a, a 40 
dollars top up on your e-transport card every month. So a lot of our older persons are um, allowed to visit, you know, to move freely using the public transport uh, uh, bus uh, services. Huh? We also have the free medicine scheme, which the Ministry of Health uh, you know, controls in terms of registration. But there's an a income threshold for those that are below 20,000 each year, they could probably apply for these benefits. And older persons are also part of the queue in this as well. We have long-term care, though unstructured, and there's a lot of development uh, that needs to be done in the area. So discussions around the room and so many meetings that we go to, uh, we can only take back home what we can contextualize and implement. You know, it comes down to economics at the end of the day. But we have eight institutional homes for, you know, not only, they are institutional homes of care, but it's not necessarily only for older persons. There's a, you know, there's a bit of a fruit salad in the home where you have, um, you know, uh, those that are disabled, those that are psychologically challenged, and inclusive of the oldest as well. But the five, five of those eight homes, they also access the social pension scheme that I have alluded to, meaning $100 every month, equivalent of 50 US dollars every month. And that's just to complement the operations of the homes. The three, where the other three disappeared to, these are the three state homes administered by government. So to avoid double keeping, we said, okay, the breakfast, lunch, and dinner has been catered for and everything else, probably you don't have to reach on that social pension scheme. Now the challenges, ladies and gentlemen, it's really about implementation issues. We've got mechanisms locked in, legislation, but you know, pace of implementation, resourcing, and all that. So it's really about collaboration, resourcing, we, we find that you might have people sitting in the same room with you to discuss a certain agenda on how do we implement uh, this, um, you know, uh, this thing that we want for aging. But, you know, the guy on the other side of uh, the table is not sensitized yet. He's just there to take notes and take it back. So I, I believe that uh, we really need to, to go down to sensitizing our partners so that we can comprehend it. Uh, you know, it's serious business when you get to address aging and implementation. Five more minutes. Okay, this will take two. Research and development, data and information. You know, just echoing what our colleagues have echoed before is not in here. But uh, what we're really uh, quite passionate about is the last one as well, where we get to, we're hoping to develop a holistic legislation for all the persons that, you know, uh, we've had. Uh, reassurance from uh, some of the experts around the room that maybe we can we can knock on doors uh, just to have some of the, the technicalities that we might uh, need to justify. Uh, but then again, it's, it's about contextualizing. Ladies and gentlemen, there I have it. Way Forward is really, you know, working on the challenges. Thank you very much.
No, that is an outline. First, I would want to contextualize this paper. Now, if you consider current international and national debate, like what we have just met here before, people are concerned about nation aging, and there are two key important issues that underline or underpin this concept. And the very first one is how to make sure individual needs globally are met for this group of people. And then also how the challenges that are associated with it in our society are also there. And I think these are two major issues that are concerned of the SDGs that we are expected to achieve by the year 2020. Now, if you talk about aging globally, not only in Africa, we have made we have been made to understand that we don't have to consider only the biological age structure, but also the specific age group situations and then contextual aspect of it should also be because numbers alone cannot make it, but the capabilities and abilities of individuals must also be captured in the definition of who that person I was given an example where my grandmother is 78, but she goes to work every day. She's a farmer, and she wants to be at a farm, bring something home every day. And that such a person cannot be considered to me as an older person because she does do more than what I can do. So all these things, these mechanisms are very important should be considered in our analysis of aging. And of course, country concept and the context are also uh, taken into consideration. Now, we have three points of purchase for this day. Now, the very first one is we are considering um, Sub-Saharan Africa because this is a place where, though it uh, looks younger in terms of patient uh, aging, but um, currently the pace of group of older persons in terms of numbers and the portions are uh, higher than any other global region. And that means emphasis should be placed in here. Now, um, going back to Africa, we find that most of the people are in informal sector, especially older women. They contribute to unpaid women. And we think that concentrating and finding out problems of these people might help them to work better to develop their society. Then the second point is also that we are talking about poverty in older persons because this is a very serious issue in Africa. Now, if you look at every world statistics from WHO, from World Bank, we find those Sub-Saharan African countries are the bottom in terms of um, economic um, uh, empowerment or economic development. And poverty really is a key when we talk about Africa. And we decided to carve out this particular situation and see how best we can uh, contribute to um, dealing with that situation. And of course, when we're talking about poverty, it comes to vulnerability. And these older persons that are retired without former pensions and all that, of course, a chunk of African um, older persons are retired and not that the informal sector, but informal sector. So they don't have any pensions that will cater for them as they will be older. And this vulnerability is a, a, a subject that we can depart from. And at the end of the day, though this is a very important concept, but little has been done in our context. Now the third thing that we are not, we are considering Africa in general, but specifically looking at slums, communities, or informal settlement comes to the scene of today. Now, currently every uh, urban community is expanded in terms of numbers. People are been in through migration and all that. But because of lack of planning in these communities, we tend to have urban slums. A lot of people are within poverty within these slums. And vulnerability is at its core this particular end. And for that matter, this study concerns on that particular aspect. Now these are some statistics that um, are very important, indicating that for Africa, we have fifty five percent of our region in slum areas and it keeps expanding almost every day. And then we also have 56% of total global issues, the numbers of slums between 1990 and 2004. 
Sì, esatto, che ha deciso. Sì. So, we are studying first provide trends in chronological age structure, also patterns, trends and poverty age relationship. We will, we will talk about that briefly. And then finally, what implications that our study is going to have for the aging population and development in general. Now, our data was taken from Nairobi Urban Health and Demographic uh, Surveillance System, um, DSS for short. And this um, longitudinal study has been running from 2002 up to date. And of course, um, we don't have much of the such studies in Ghana. Um, Ghana, Nairobi, or any other place in Africa is very, very key, but we don't have them done. So we concentrated on this data to bring out and find it. Of course, there are a lot of uh, um, older persons captured within this particular data, and we, we thought that it is something that could be very much representative to talk about it. Now, with our method, these are key variables that we, we included. Uh, core one is a poverty measure. But that was based on food security or food insecurity. That was subjectively um, taken by the participants of the study. And then we tried to analyze using logistic regression and um, descriptive analysis. So, what we find that this chart tells us about uh, the overall distribution of the population in the data. And then we find that uh, in 2015, we find the uh, proportion of the, uh, these are numbers, absolute numbers, so the numbers of older persons uh, from 60 plus is a bit of increase as compared to the previous areas. Then um, this curve also tells about the rate of growth of population within 60 year class. And what we find is this, um, generally overall from we pick between um, 2007 uh, to 2015, because those data were very kind of where I was decided to go with that. So between the two, we have we picked various um, um, rates, and we found that overall, we have 41% for, for increase in population age in those entering 60 years, uh, between um, 2007 and 2015. And then in between years, in between years, we also find about 5.2 percent group. So it tells you the numbers uh, of concern. They are increasing very much. Now, this curve gives trends to the population proportion of older persons. And we find that um, older people, that is those in uh, 60 to 69, was increasing, and now it is all a little bit. But you can see those within 70 to 79 is rising. But the, the oldest old, that is the 80 class, um, the, the element of a, a lower rate of rising. Then with the food insecurity, this is very important. What we find is that, um, but this is for overall from um, the 18 year old up to what about the 80 class. But what we find the last day, um, bars indicates that those people within 60, up to 80 plus uh, in, in terms of food insecurity at the highest level. So the younger group are better off as compared to the older persons. And that means that older people are really important in terms of food insecurity. Of course, food is everything. So if I only able to care for yourself, having what you're supposed to have at the day, then it tells, um, it goes beyond any other kind of poverty that anyone can define. And then this one also gives us, let's start the um, curve. It gives us indication about food insecurity across the various years that we consider. So we can see that the older persons are still within that number of food insecurity is very high. Now we have um, a table that shows the uh, regression with the results of uh, um, food insecurity showing all the issues because of the space we decided to delete any other. And then indicate uh, indication and give only the, the observations. And we find that across board, you know, food is really being you know, it increases. In fact, if you look at it, I, I regret it based on food security, the other way around. So in this in this case it means that um, as age increases, food 
their security also increases, or the other way around. So I don't think they, we find that um, food insecurity is really an issue with older persons. So what we find here is that slum populations may be aging in terms of numbers, um, but this is faster, very faster in rural communities as compared to um, those people in urban settings. And then it also reflects the fact that then we should have um, rural urban migration dictating um, as uh, whatever uh, uh, intervention. I don't think they, um, people are too many urban slums are increasing in numbers and proportions. And when there are mechanisms to deal with this, definitely uh, the, the issues will be climate. And then also talk about aging in place as a contributing issue here. And then um, return migration is another thing that we consider. So um, we are on the view that there is a need for social protection for older persons. As we grow older, 60 years and above, we should also have a better social protection so that people will be able to cover in terms of food um, security. And I also talk about um, letting people know, especially those in um, younger and the middle ages, to um, get up for their own age by saving um, uh, whatever being financially included, getting savings all over so that they can get up for them as they go over and be able to um, cover up with food security. And I also talk of um, social support. Currently in Africa, social support is being eroded, not as it used to be because of this migration issue or all that we're talking about. And we also propose that if there is a capacity to improve key relationships, definitely older persons might be covered because if government is not doing it, we expect the family within which the older person lives um, to also to support that older person. And also pensions must be um, given. In Ghana, for instance, there is a debate currently that people that are within even informal sector um, should be captured in pensions so that there is a scheme that every month you calculate any person you can contribute in there. And people are concerned about the fact that um, how safe is that going to be? But if such things are done, we think that the hope to safeguard other persons as they go older. So, um, with policies, we focus on slums, slums areas, and we think that this is very important because whose habitat free issues, well, um, cities and all the expanding cities, and when cities are growing, it means that. Where the former planning are not done, definitely there's going to be an issue of slabs. So we should well, be thinking of considering this as another point. And pensions, as I did mention earlier, would be a point of concern. Now, with our data, we concentrate on um, self reports, as I mentioned earlier. And then SDG 1 and 2, this emphasis on that. Currently, we are thinking of what the person himself or herself will appreciate to be better for him, not what any other person has such a logic to calculate for them. So I don't think it's very important. And of course, we also use a long term study that we think that it is robust enough to give a good story. And our next studies related to this one will be dealing with government trends in age structure, food security beyond 2015, because this long term study is ongoing. So every year, we have two rounds that we can take. So as we accumulate um, a larger number of other persons, we think we'll be able to represent better findings. Thank you very much.
Yeah, I'm Suha Fawad from Kina and Foundation Age here. And my question is about uh, your presentation from Fiji, who is the qualified residents who will have the rights to, uh, for the five homes, and what are the five homes do for them? From your presentation. Sorry, I, I didn't quite uh, get your question. You're asking about the five homes? Yeah, yeah. You said you have uh, the, the eight, right? Um, Institutional uh, homes and the other five for the for the qualified residents homes for the qualified resident and who is the qualified resident and what do the five homes do for them? Okay, thanks for the question. Yeah. Now let me just break it down very briefly. Yeah? Um, I did say that there were eight institutional homes. Okay, yeah? okay. it's not only for older persons, but uh, there's a mixture. But in those eight homes, three are run by government. Okay? The social protection programs for older persons is also administered by government. So with, with the, the other non-state homes, the five, government gets to give them the social pension for those that qualify, 65 and above older persons in those five homes. Okay. Those that are age 65 plus in those five homes, they can get the social pension. Yes, because they are already vulnerable, they are in those homes. Those are, in, out of those eight homes, out of those eight homes, only two are user pay. Three are by government, okay. which leaves us with just three who needs, um, who can probably qualify based on the age. Okay, so these are faith-based homes. They can be faith-based um, homes. So we get to give those in the homes that qualify by age with $100 per month. So if in those three homes we have at least 20 people that qualify, we will give money, $100 a month, just to help with the administration of, of those uh, can you elaborate more about the homes? Like, uh, are there any activities or components in homes? For yes. Yeah. Yes. These homes are run by their own uh, managers, and, and they have their. For us in government, uh, we we don't dictate what happens in those homes, but because of you know we we are lobbying for active aging and all that, we have a particular forum that's being established for the Institutional Forum for Aged Care Facilities in Fiji. We get to share minimum standard requirements. Uh, government has just launched the national minimum standards for institutional homes on care of older persons. We're trying to implement the, you know, uh, like training on those standards and actually resourcing it. So we've just launched it last year. So in, in those standards, they, you know, they, there's, um, there's things about activities, you know, for so that is a resident-centered care, also looking at the administration and how they complement, um, you know, the utopia for aging in those homes. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Um, let's move on to the third presentation on population aging and the need for social protection in Asia and the Pacific by Ms. Simai. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, looking forward to this session. I had a lot of thoughts during the session in the morning and I'm also trying to respond to some of the issues that were raised uh, during these one and a half days of so um, I would like, yeah, the statement, we often say the Asia-Pacific region is aging rapidly and this was somehow contested uh, and also because we're using the chronological age as a measure fully true. But one point I would say what is quite different in this region, in Europe fertility levels were already much lower end of uh, the 19th century than in the middle of this century in Asia. Also social protection systems were introduced much earlier even before there was any talk of population aging in, in Europe. So the development gap was a very different one from what uh, Asian countries are experiencing. 
Um, if we look at fertility rates in China, they were still at about uh, six, around six uh, children per woman in the 1950s. If we think of the higher fertility countries in Europe, it was in Poland, it was in about three. Um, so there's a big difference. And then policies were introduced in Asia. Um, we all know the one-child policy in China, which led to a very rapid fertility decline and leading to very rapid population aging, as we're still talking about in China. Another example is the Islamic Republic of Iran, which is uh, actually faced a similar fertility decline. Um, actually, yeah, after the mid of the 1980s, where fertility, because of investments in women's education, actually, uh, fertility went down, and it is to be expected that uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran will also be one of the most rapidly aging countries. So I must say, we still feel for us as a policy tool, it is still important to highlight this rapid aging process, while additional measures can have no doubt help to show a different image of aging. So if we look at the status of social protection of pension systems, we see that coverage of pension systems is still quite in most of the countries, except for a few exceptions. Yes, in Japan, more than about 85% of the working age populations are covered by a pension system, because we know uh, Japan is the most aged one. Then we have the countries uh, with the Soviet heritage, such as Kazakhstan, for example, um, Fiji has good coverage because it was introduced early and also well, so, uh, because of the global heritage but also more investments in coverage. And um, China is an example which very recently invested in uh, pensions, uh, yeah, in pensions and now has higher coverage uh, reaching about 50% of the current working age population. But in most countries we can see less than one third of the population is paying into a pension system. And I'm used to the current working age population because they are going to be the future of a person. So we can expect that only the minority of them will receive a pension later. And if we look at men and women, and that's also a big issue, we have uh, only few countries uh, provide this uh, aggregated data by men and women. Most countries just report one overall uh, number. Um, but in most countries where we have data, uh, pensions coverage of women is lower than of men. And why? It's quite intuitive because pensions are a work-based tool and the typically women's labor force participation is lower so uh, there's less pensions coverage. Um, so let us now look at life expectancy at retirement. And we can see in Vietnam, the woman, when she retires, had still had, can expect to live at the, uh, about 29 years. Uh, a man less, because in Vietnam, uh, the pensionable age, or the mandatory pension age is at 55, and for men it's at 60. If we look at uh, Japan, where we know it has the highest life but life expectancy at retirement is lower than in Vietnam or in China um, because uh, now uh, Japan increased the pensions aid at 65. If we look at Indonesia, for example, life expectancy at retirement is still less than uh, 20 because e even though the uh, retirement age is at 57 because of low overall life expectancy. But if we have look, for example, at Vietnam, um, a woman, when she retires, has to live from her for 30 years from her pension. And she only has maybe about the same, the same time she's paying into the pension system. She has to live out of that pension. So, um, so the low retirement ages are, in many countries, can be one issue. And, uh, and in many cases, it's many. Also, the difference between a uh, different retirement age for men and women. Um, when we sometimes talked to government officials of Vietnam, if there are any considerations to, um, to 
to equalize the retirement of uh, age of men and women, their response is, no, this is to give women the reward because they have to provide more care to the family and so we let them retire earlier so they can do other things. But the reality is then she will receive lower pensions because of their breaks in the payment uh, time and uh, um, the benefit levels are typically very low. So if we look at the adequacy of pension benefits, we find a small proportion of the working age population is paying into a pension system, so it's covered. So will they receive enough? And there is a huge variety. In Thailand, uh, it seems that overall it is quite adequate, but in other countries, like say Tajikistan, Philippines, Kazakhstan, Cambodia, the pension benefits are very low, and they are only edited for, um, as in Cambodia, for all 12% of uh, the pensioners. And now let us look at the informal sector, and the informal sector is playing a large role in most Asian countries, and I think it's something very specific, because in many countries, the informal sector serves of, as a sort of unemployment insurance. For example, in Thailand, there is almost no unemployment. Um, but what happens if people don't find a job in the formal sector? They go in the informal sector to earn a living. But on paper, it doesn't show that they, they are university graduates you can find in the informal sector. So on paper, they don't show up as unemployed, but maybe they might be not adequately employed. Um, but they have an income because of the, uh, they can work in the informal sector. But we have to take into consideration that social protection in the informal sector is very limited. So we also find that all the persons who work typically work in the informal sector, and this has two things. Um, number one, those who are in the informal sector, they cannot retire, so they always have to and also a lot of informal sector jobs can be hazardous, can be dangerous, can be exposed to um, pollution. Now in Bangkok there's more talk of pollution than before. So uh, let's say the street vendors of the wonderful street food, they are in the pollution all day. Um, and a lot of other informal sector jobs can be considered as dangerous. And all the, uh, also because of in, if all the persons want to work often, they only uh, jobs they find are in the informal sector. Um, there is data from Korea, for example, that a lot of older persons um, work in the informal sector because of um, age discriminatory labor laws, because of age discrimination, they do not find a job in the informal sector. So, to summarize about pensions, they actually tend to perpetuate existing inequality rather leveling them out. They are work-based, so only those who, are, who participated in the formal say, labor force are included. The second thing, there are no redistribution <coughs> mechanisms. They are designed in a, um, yeah, in a way that they are maybe financially made sense. So they often have to find contribution systems. So you pay in and um, your, but what you get is based on, what you receive later is based on what you paid in. There are no redistribution mechanisms. Um, this was sometimes also on advice of uh, other financial institutions who advised them to uh, look only at the financial viability but not to take social considerations. Then, uh, pension systems are not gender responsive. Um, there is nothing like a child credit for women, or um, and they are structurally disadvantaged. And um, but actually, social pensions are important, but they actually do not address the, uh, those structural inequalities. Okay. So what do people? Where do they live from? We found that many older persons still work. Um, more men work than women, although maybe women would need to work more to make uh, an income. But those, uh, if you didn't work throughout, if women didn't work throughout the life cycle, they will not find a job when they are old. Um, 
we also find that employment decreases with old age. And studies have also found, and I would like to thank our uh, friends from HealthAge, that the uh, health reasons are the main reasons why older persons stop working. So, yeah, but another reason is sometimes family responsibility. We also find that, um, yeah, we discussed, this was discussed earlier, a lot of older persons um, have disabilities and the level of disability increases with age. So very often they are not able to work anymore because of the disability or, or health reasons. Another example from Thailand. So what do all the persons take their income from? Um, in Thailand, it was found that most of the, in of the uh, income still comes from support from children or work income. Other incomes are quite low. So pensions only because of low coverage, uh, low, little of the income comes from pensions. And savings are also quite low. And so by age group, on actually most of the older persons in Thailand do not have any savings. In the age group of 64 to 60 to 64, only about 35 percent actually have saving, and then the savings go down by age. It's natural that the savings go down by age because they the save, but actually they are going down relatively little. That they should maybe go down in a more linear way if you assume that they the save or you don't think they the save, um, and then there is nothing left. Well, number one, you never know when you die, so you always need to keep something and some may want to inherit. And you can also assume that only the wealthier income groups can actually save. And they probably have so much wealth and savings that they don't have to spend it all. So, the case was made. Yeah, to make it, I think that's just enough. <laughs> um, the case was made so there's actually relatively little social protection. People, most in most cases, still depend on act, either in uh, transfers from their children or they have to work, and we do not know about the quality of the work. Uh, we do not know if they want to work or work out of need. So, social protection would be the typical UN answer, and I cannot be the UN without mentioning the sustainable development goals. And um, this is what countries committed to. So there, um, if we want to uh, re reduce the proportion of women, men, and children of all ages living in poverty, social protection will be important. And, um, so countries also committed to increase the coverage of the poor and the vulnerable, and older persons are considered as one of the vulnerable. That's gender equality. We've seen that the existing pension systems are not gender responsive and there is a considerable gender inequality in incomes. And this comes throughout the life cycle. Uh, there we know of all the gender inequalities throughout the life cycle and they are typically perpetuated in the old age. And uh, countries also commit to reducing inequalities and adopt policies uh, and social protection policies So um, the conclusion is we need social protection to achieve the, uh, the SDGs. In some cases, the way aging is measured and defined can decide over income and no income, actually, because in some countries there is a social pension above a certain age. And, um, and sometimes it's done quite, in some countries, for example, they decided we introduce it for people over 90 or for people over 80, depending on the fiscal capacity of the country. So this uh, is an easy to identify measure for governments, but it can decide uh, whether you receive an income or not. Um, also, we conclude that the mandatory retirement age is too low in some countries, uh, the, which makes also pension systems unsustainable, and also for, uh, at the individual level, these to low benefit. Levels. And yes, the MEET also recommends not having a mandatory retirement, but age people should be able to decide when they want to retire or not. Um, 
So, uh, one of the guiding questions I receive are the tools, uh, existing tools, uh, appropriate to address the gender inequalities, and uh, the answer is no. Currently, um, the tools that currently exist don't uh, address gender inequalities, they rather perpetuate them, uh, which are accumulated. until the end of the last presentation. Um, so next, let's move on to the last presentation by um, Dr. Philip. Or In ways, this title is a silly title to take on in 15 minutes. Um, so I won't pretend to be by any means comprehensive. Um, but let me, let me kind of skim through. Right. Um, Firstly, just to start, I'm going to focus mostly on pensions and aged care, but, but just to remind ourselves, you know, that, that, and a lot of this echoes what Vanessa said, uh, that work remains the primary source of financial protection, and the lower the income country, the more that's true. We saw that for Asia in Vanessa's presentation. You see it for different regions of the world here. Some of that is obvious. The African example very much echoes what Razak was saying, also about older workers. This is for all people over 65. So you can imagine for those between 65 and 75 or 65 and 80, these numbers are substantially higher. Basically, people work till they drop in, in many countries, as we saw in Vanessa's data. Um, the other interesting thing I think to notice here is that for North America, Oceania, Europe, rather than the convergence towards the developing countries kind of looking more like developed countries and maybe working shorter, it's the other way around. Um, that the developed countries are actually starting to work well, but the convergence is the other way to maybe what we would have expected historically. Um, the second thing I think is a general contextual thing is just how high elderly co-residence rates remain across the developing world. And I think often when we look at data from Europe or, or the OECD, we forget just how high these numbers remain. And so when we talk about intergenerality, intergenerational, or the life cycle, the life cycle exists in its fullness within nearly every household in the developing world already, uh, with, with the many implications that brings. That said, and the NTAs across many developing countries show us this, the patterns of financial flows between the elderly in these households and their adult children, grandchildren, and others are much more complex than, than traditional economics would, would suggest. As Hesus was talking about the uh, life cycle hypothesis, certainly that much of the NTA uh, data doesn't show that. And even in developed countries, as Agar was showing, it's changing over time. Um, so that even in old age, old people can be transferring in a developed country to their, to their children for, for some portion of old age. Um, the other thing to notice, of course, is that on the right-hand side of this co-residence declines with income level. Privacy is a normal good, and um, across the world we, we see that. And you see that partly these ranges in a, in a region like uh, Eastern Europe and Central Asia reflect that, that these big differences from one part of the region to another largely reflect huge differences in income levels in, in these regions. Um, but just to say, I think overall that if we look at certainly Asia and many parts of the developing world, that the transfers from the elderly to the working age adults are much longer lasting than, than we'd see in the developed world. And that makes perfect sense if you look at those work patterns uh, that you saw in the first slide. Coming to pensions, and a lot of this, as I said, will echo what Vanessa said. Um, on the left hand side you have the share of working age population contributing to a contributory formal pension scheme um, and there's a very tight correlation with country income levels. You see some of the Asian countries I've highlighted there but across the board it's, it's very strongly correlated with informality and country income levels. One thing that this doesn't show is that that curve, as steep as it is, overall has shifted downwards since the early 90s. That is, at any in given income level, participation rates in contributory pension systems are lower than they were in the early 1990s. And that's important. 
because we always work on this assumption that the world will gradually formalise, contributory pension systems will gradually expand their coverage, and that's simply not empirically true. The other point, which I think Vanessa already made very clearly for a number of countries, is the, the male, female, the, the gender divide. Partly as a result of um, labor force participation rates, but a, a host of other reasons too. Often vesting rules, which present, prevent women with partial working careers from vesting in pension systems. Um, I want to focus now on the more dynamic picture. This, this picture shows you in the blue bars are the current coverage rates which as you see for many countries are, uh, are very low, as, we, as again we saw in Vanessa's presentation. But I want you to focus on the dotted line and, the, and those yellow dots and the right hand um, column. Basically this is the rate of change of coverage in contributory pension systems between the early 1990s and the early 2010s. And the remarkable thing there is how many of those dots cluster right on the line or even below it. So in that last quarter century, coverage in most of the developing world has not expanded at all. And in fact, look at Mexico, look at some countries, it's fallen. Um, there are some success stories, I think Turkey is one there. China was mentioned, but that wasn't done through a, a purely contributory system. It's a very hybrid model that the Chinese use to expand coverage. So essentially, I think we can say fairly confidently that informality is stubborn, coverage, low coverage is stubborn, and so the social insurance model we have that we always assume would gradually expand and cover people, it ain't working. And that's why I've got um, Chancellor Bismarck there on the right hand side who introduced the social insurance to the world looking so bewildered. Um, actually, as a sideline, when Bismarck introduced the legislation for social insurance, he wasn't proposing contributions from salary. He was proposing a levy on, on other stuff, but the parliament decided otherwise. Um, now, one response has been widespread introduction of social pensions, some universal, some targeted. These dots here are, are countries that introduced a social pension scheme at, at certain years in that stage. If you go beyond 2010, you continue to get more developing countries doing so in response to this failure of coverage expansion of, of formal schemes. They're diverse, some are universal, some are targeted. The other diversity is the generosity of them varies quite considerably across developed and developing countries and within developing countries. So you look at Kiribati or Timor there where the, the benefit as a share of per capita income is close to half of per capita income. Remarkably generous. But even Brazil, 35% and others. But if you look at the green dots, uh, are this region, and in contrast, they're, they're remarkably low, remarkably parsimonious benefits, and clearly not ones that on their own are going to provide any serious uh, financial protection in, in old age. Um, that said, I, I point to a couple of things which many of you will be familiar with. If you look at South Africa, for example, it's important not just to think of the elderly, and there are good studies there from Hottenheit and, and many others that show some of the, because of the intergenerationality, if that's a word, of households, uh, the positive effects on children and, and other younger members of the household of these social pensions. Even in India, which is right down the bottom there, you see a very, very low benefit level. Studies we did in Rajasthan, for example, in very arid areas of Rajasthan, showed that the very small transfers, particularly to grandmothers, were crowding in private transfers because at least someone in the household had a steady income. As low as it was, it was steady in an economy, a rural economy, where there was very volatile incomes otherwise. So you saw crowding in of transfers. Now, despite all this story, when, when we ask people um, across Asia anyway, who should be most responsible providing income to retired people? You look at those green bars of government, and it's a, it's a great example of cognitive dissonance, I think, <laughs> kind of reality and, and expectations or hopes confounding one another. The interesting part is that the richer countries, which have the higher coverage and where pensions actually have some adequacy, 
Uh, people have much more modest expectations of the state. They expect to support themselves and they actually have very low expectations of their children as well. Um, so it, it just the, these kind of long-term time horizon things like pensions, I think introduce, you know, they're a behavioral economist's dream. They introduce all kinds of possibilities between myopia, cognitive dissonance, all kinds of funny uh, tricks our brains play. So people are expecting a lot more from the state than the state is currently providing or is likely to be providing. If we switch to care, um, so this is kind of aged care, long-term care, and I'm going to kind of roll those two together. Uh, the legal rights, so a right to aged care supported by the state, um, I think the striking thing of this map, this is done try alone, uh, is that for most, many countries of the world we simply don't know. It's not very well understood, or not very well documented anyway, if, if there is a right or not. Most of these countries, I suspect, not. Um, and even in very rich countries, look at Canada, which we think of as a pretty strong welfare state, no right to, to this. So across the world, even the great countries are often very tightly means tested. My own country, Australia, you've got to be pretty poor to get aged care support from the state. Um, so the picture here is that we remain largely in an informal world of care, even in many rich countries. Um, if we look more specifically at developing countries, on the left you have as a share of GDP some spending numbers. I think if, if you're from any particular country, you'll always say that's wrong for my country, and it probably is. Um, partly because some of this happens sub-nationally and that's not always well picked up. But I think the general story holds that, I mean, the, the percentages of GDP we're looking at there are at a maximum in Korea, 0.3% of GDP. So even the more, most generous example you've got there is extremely modest level of spending and, and many are basically at zero. Uh, that said, on the right hand side, OECD has done projections for spending at least in the BRICS countries, and they project by 26 it'll be up to 1.3% of GDP, but it's, that's a kind of maximum estimate. We really don't know, and I think it's far too far into the future to say um, for that. So spending very low, um, and unlikely to remain so for quite some time, given the lack of rights and policies on this. The other thing that's really striking, even in countries where there is a commitment, and China is a very good example in this region, is just how big a gap in workforce there is. Um, globally, almost 14 million shortfall in full-time equivalent workers, and most of that in Asia. So there's simply not the kind of qualified workforce to deal with the demand that, that is expected. And if you look by region, the, sh the shortfalls in percentage terms in Africa are 92% shortfall, which one could say, uh, you know, good luck with that. Um, or, you know, talk, talk to your children. Um, uh, but even in some of the richer parts of the world, even in Europe, it's 30%. Uh, Asia Pacific, two thirds shortfall. So, even in these countries, and China is another good one, who are starting to put money into this a bit more significantly in recent years, um, you've got huge structural issues in the sector of how responsive on the supply side the sector is likely to be. Um, now, again, another case of cognitive dissonance. Despite this, we, we have, again, a lot of expectations of the state. This is a similar question, but who would provide you care in old age? Green bars again of the government. Now, the cognitive dissonance uh, varies across countries. Seems like Filipinos and Vietnamese are more realistic about this than others. But, but still, the expectations of the state are still remarkably high, given what we saw is the current situation in, in many countries. So finally, just two slides to summarize. Um, on financial protection, here, here I'm focusing on pensions. A purely contributory model clearly is not going to do the coverage job we need in the developing world and particularly in rapidly aging regions like Asia. So you're going to need many more public subsidies, you're going to spend more on your social protection system and it, it will, be, will be subsidies. 
but you need a lot of innovation in how they'll be provided. Now, whether that's matching schemes, whether it's pre-funded social pensions, like Santiago Levy and others have, have proposed, or whether it's other kind of mixed savings instruments or hybrid schemes like China's, all kinds of options, but clearly they'll need to be innovation. Secondly, to create the fiscal space to have those subsidies, clearly deeper reforms of many contributory systems in the region, this region are needed. Vietnam is a primary example. Uh, they've got to be sustainable on their own. Otherwise, it's just the budget subsidising the rich and no subsidies for the poor. Uh, reallocate consumer subsidies to create that space, which still remain remarkably high in much of the world, particularly in regions like the Middle East. Um, and of course, to more generally improve uh, revenue performance. We would agree with the UN that we should remove, ideally remove mandatory retirement age altogether, or at minimum adjust them automatically in line with prospective ageing, and don't incentivise early retirement or punish um, longer working lives through the pension or tax systems. And just to throw in at the end, the silver bullet of a universal basic income, UBI, whilst it's very enticing, I think from work we've done recently, the World Development Report, I think we would say it's not affordable if it's adequate in the vast majority of developing countries, and it's not adequate if it's affordable. Um, so <laughs> that's not true for all. Russia is an example where our empirical analysis shows that's actually not true, but the vast majority. Finally, on aged care, last slide. Um, the main thing here, I think, is to have dedicated policies and institutional clarity. Most countries are either defaulting to families and or the health system. The health system is a very expensive way to do it. The family has a lot of hidden costs as a way of doing it. So have a policy, and many countries don't. Secondly, to then when you have that, have basic regulatory oversight and stewardship. Look at the financing model. Um, with a focus on home and community-based care rather than infrastructure. A key one is this on this HR question is decide what level of professionalisation is appropriate. Don't assume you're going to be stacked with gerontologists and skilled nurses all of a sudden when you've never had them before. America doesn't have enough gerontologists. Developing countries are not going to have them in the foreseeable future. So decide whether it's community-based, uh, carer, home-based carers or others Take a really thought out decision of professionalisation and don't end up over professionalising what will only service the rich. And of course, the private sector, whether it's for profit, not for profit, communities, etc., will have to be and continue to be massively involved. Thank you. That, that last report is a, a regional report on ageing we've done a couple of years ago. Um, if I can take 30 seconds, just the title of that, those of you who are Star Trek fans might recognise. When we went to get this published, our publications people said, oh, we've got a right to whoever owns Star Trek, our CBS or Sony or someone. And they wrote back a letter saying, you can use this title provided you put no spaceships on the cover. <laughs> so there was a temptation to do it once they'd said that, but in the end we did. Thanks. Yeah, hi. I, I, at some point I sensed a confusion or a lack of explicitness between contributory pension and a defined contribution pension. Uh, you, you know the difference. Um, as I recall, Vietnam had, a, had a, for the formal sector, had a uh, contributory system, VSS, wasn't very good. Uh, they were trying to put in place uh, a uh, defined contribution system for the countryside, which was actuarially not very sound. Uh, China, as you say, is very, very exotic kind of thing. But um, you know, you've got these various defined contribution uh, um, provident schemes, very, very common in the region, paying very little rates, and people would just spend the money on house or something like that. So, to what extent are defined? Uh, to, to what extent are, are uh, defined benefit? Uh, um, uh, contributory schemes still a player in, in, in the region, outside of people who work for insurance companies and banks and things like that.
we can take a few more questions. Uh, quick question. Uh, does the region plan any universal pensions? I don't think I have heard anyone talking about that because I know in Africa some countries or countries increasingly do it even if you only cover older persons by the age of 90 or 95. At least some countries start somewhere. Hello, my name is Patricia Conboy from HelpAge and I'd like to ask a question of Razak. In terms of your findings from the poverty studies, do you find any data on older people with disabilities and their particular experience in relation to poverty? Hello, hi, Shereen. Um, just thank the panel for a very, very good um, Presentations. Uh, a few uh, questions, uh, some of them may be um, common, uh, related to the, the stages where developing countries are in, in terms of population aging comparable to the developed world. And it's interesting that we've been having this debate about measuring and relativity. And uh, just to highlight the, the point, the standing point of different countries, not only in terms of the age structure but as you've been talking about social protection uh, and even patterns of employment are taking different forms, maybe because of financial security. Um, then uh, a question uh, to Philip um, relates to uh, Caroline's point as well about universal coverage, which is also about the household income as a unit, because you talked about co-residency and how welfare reforms can address um, all the people through different households benefits and welfare system. Um, so if you've got some insight on that, thank you. Could you please um, keep your question and until the second round, so we'll take the speaker at the first question. There's, well, firstly, I should say globally about 50% of public pension systems are still defined benefits. So it's still a very big part of the story, as you know, there's been reversals on some of the defined contribution reforms. In this region, the, the kind of national schemes that have defined benefit put into the side of civil servants, Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, Myanmar, uh, Laos, China, the, the base part of it is, is defined benefit. So there's still quite a lot of defined benefit out there. The provident fund, any Commonwealth country tends to have a provident fund, so that's DC by definition. Um, or if you want to call it a DC, but yeah, a, a DC like, not DB. So there's still a lot of DB in the region, defined benefit in the region. Um, China has you know, layers that with a, with a defined contribution portion, and then the new scheme as you said, exotic is the word. It's a contributory social pension, I would say. Um, in financing terms, what you do in China for the rural and the urban, and this is the way they've expanded, um, is you contribute a small amount each year, generally flat, can be as low as 100 RMB, so $15 or so, and that's matched at 30%, relative, and it's not clear that the matching is actually happening. Um, but when you get to 60, that triggers a lifetime monthly benefit of currently, I think, about 80 RMB, something like that. Um, so in financing terms, it's 80% subsidy. Um, it's really a social pension, but it's structured in a contributory way, and their logic is not financial, but that you'll have the records and accounting system so that if people move into the formal sector, you've already got them in a scheme. And that's, that's certainly the argument that Chinese officials make. On, on the social pension side of things, there are some universal examples in the region. Uh, Timor was, was a, a very good example, uh, immediately post-independence. A number of the Pacific Islands have had universal social pensions, uh, Kiribati, Samoa, um, you'll probably know more, Vanessa, but there are a, a couple of others. 
Um, so they're there. Myanmar has introduced, I think, a fairly, I think it's all but universally for pension testing, one of the two, above 90. Um, Vietnam has it above 80. Um, so a, a number of them have it in some shape or form with, with different cutoffs, um, cutoff points um, on, the, on the social pension side. And Thailand is, is pretty close to universal. It's pension tested. It ends up being 80, 85 percent, I think, of people are entitled to the, the social pension. Um, of the general welfare question, maybe we can all come back to it. Yeah, I would like to add on the provident funds that globally only few countries have a provident fund. And then once we had a, a course on pensions in the Pacific, and then there was the question, so which countries, uh, which of you have a provident fund? And all except one raised their hands. And so we have concentration of provident funds in the Pacific and also in South Asia, which is part of the colonial heritage. And um, strictly speaking, the International Association for Social Security doesn't consider provident funds as social because you get a lump sum and then it's up to you to decide what you do. Theoretically, you can invest it very prudently and make sure you get the monthly or you, you, your the savings are used very prudently, but what actually you can also add uh, what is often said many people spend it on one thing. Um, in many cases they buy a house, which is also good. Um, a host then, but in many cases it is also given to the family members, so they end up without anything. So um, this is an issue, and many countries have tried to turn the provident fund into a mon uh, monthly pension, but there is quite a lot of resistance among the beneficiaries because they are used to this lump sum and they even expect this lump sum. Um, sometimes they wait for it when they retire, then they want to move back to the countryside. When they or in the Pacific Islands to the more, uh, they move back to the outer islands and want to build a house. So this is actually very difficult to change. Um, on the universal pensions, yes, there are a lot of countries, like you mentioned, have a social pension, but in many cases the social pension is small. Um, it's not enough to live from. It's more a small contribution which uh, increases the dignity as it has a lot of benef benefits, but not enough. The Republic of Korea also has a bit of a hybrid system. There is the basic pension, which is like a universal pension, and this is then supplemented with the contributory pension. Um, and India uh, is still discussing a universal basic income for all. Um, it's still in discussion and probably will remain in discussion for a while, but uh, it's coming up. And Thank you, Patricia, for the question. Um, in the latter study, we captured health issues of older persons, 60 years and above as well. And not only disability, we considered mental health as well. They are like psychological well being, depression, um, ADI, IAD, and all those things are captured. But um, we decided to concentrate for this particular show. And that's the very aspect. Based on food um, I remember one of those interviews that we conducted. Um, very good lady, about 85 years, in a wheelchair. And then she had something to say very, very touchy that I am very poor, not because I don't have food to eat. I have everything, but I cannot work for myself. I cannot go and then buy water if I want to. I cannot go and then pick up the table or chair if I want to. And that means I am poor, not that I don't have. So that tells you that health poverty is also very important. But then we decided to concentrate on the aspect of health and on a larger scale. There are a lot of things that maybe we can share with Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm Patricia Ford.
that uh, government uh, administers for the vulnerable population. But the fund is also uh, doing its work. They've also been doing consultations with all the persons themselves and of course members. Uh, there's a high tendency that very little people also opt for, when they get to be 55, they're given a choice to take lump sum or they get to turn it into a pension. So they're trying to make it a, a little bit more attractive so that people can. And so they're doing a lot of consultations, they're doing a lot of, of training and awareness around that as well because um, uh, it comes to the issue of security and old age. So yeah, we, we do have issues with that. I guess it's quite common. Just speak to the, uh, the general question of welfare system reform. I guess some of the questions on caps on household numbers will inherently, you know, go against multi-generational households. Just you know, you're saying you can only have up to four people or three people or whatever. So I guess implicitly that can disadvantage it, obviously households with, with multi-generational um, side of things. Um, the other thing on the, because UBI was touched on, just let me show you, this was a calculation we did for the uh, World Development Report, which it was average across the world and then according to income level, but the cost of a UBI that would fill the poverty gap, essentially, um, for countries at different income levels that you cover just adults or you cover the full population as a share of GDP. And you, know, you see that those numbers are, yeah, for low-income countries, there's average if you kind of total uh, revenue to GDP numbers is something like 12 percent or 13 percent. Clearly, those numbers just <laughs> yeah, blow everything out of the water. Um, for, that, for for other countries, and India did this calculation in its economic survey. The story is, is more close cut, but then it's a political economy story, not a fiscal affordability story. Can you get rid of the PDS? Can you get rid of the public? You know the uh, employment guarantee and other things to pay for this because if you, if you can't get rid of them you probably can't add this even though you're spending on subsidies and those schemes as much as you probably need in India to do in the IM, so. Thank you, Philip. We can take a few more questions. Please do. Um, so when we talk about social protection and, and, and pensions and insurance and things, we in this panel announcement, we tend to really only be talking about the state and government. But of course, when you look back into history, the, the nascent uh, schemes came from the private sector, came from individuals banding together as associations. So I suppose my question is, is given that we're starting from such a low level, um, can, the private se can the private sector or the third sector or individuals step forward to provide the kinds of goods and services that, that governments either will not or cannot uh, deliver. And, and if that is the case, uh, is there a potential, is it possible to kind of reach below the obvious middle class, upper middle class market to actually be able to provide solutions for all? Social development in SCAP, and then thereafter, I had another life as an advisor to the government of Singapore. Uh, I found this whole discussion so illuminating. But uh, I want to ask a question of care actually, different models of care. Because uh, so far, I know I've emphasized a lot on the affected ties of the family. But uh, lately, we have seen the rise of two sort of different models. One, of course, is community based care. To what extent do you think uh, this kind of uh, model should be supported? And especially, I know uh, Japan is moving into community-based care, and my own country, Singapore, is moving into it in a very big way. So what, what do you think of this uh, uh, practicality? And also linked to that, in some of our countries, and I think in the Arab space, I was going to ask you this question. But there's a lot of uh, domestic, uh, no, sorry, foreign domestic workers serving as uh, caretakers especially in, in countries where uh, institutionalization is seen as a last resort, or uh, um, where there are opportunities where you can have um, work help from other countries. So how do you see that, uh, both in terms of sustainability, viability, and also maybe uh, more formalization so that we can have a, 
I think in a different context, um, Japanese friend talked about interregionalization. So what do you think of this? Maybe not very sustainable, but is there some way we can make it uh, into a more workable model? Uh, secondly, uh, I was uh, think, looking at the uh, Japanese uh, Professor Ogawa's uh, family transfers, this big transfer from the from the family on on onto uh, in, in the last part of their lives, and that made me think about the whole concept of inequality, because you're going to have rich families being able to transfer to their families, their, their, their grandchildren, and I think in England now you have something called the class ceiling, where where bank of mom and dad is coming in. So will this um, kind of family transfers have some impact on inequality in the future? I know it's SDG, one of the important SDGs, but normally we don't think of SDGs in the context of aging, but it did occur to me that family transfers can play a role. So I'd like to have your wisdom on these two issues. Thank you. And the last, last question. Thank you. My name is Persona from uh, UNPA, working in Thailand. Um, thank you so much for a very um, excellent presentation. It's very um, uh, inspiring to really think further on the issues that are on aging. Um, if you live in Thailand, we know that in the next few uh, weeks, we're going to have the next election. And we know that all political parties that we have now talking about pension, you know, this is going to be universal pension. They're going to give you, everybody going to get a thousand baht for this party, another one said two thousand baht, another said three thousand baht. That's reality that in the few, next few weeks, that we're going to have, hopefully, we're going to have a chance to really vote. But in reality, uh, talking about uh, aging, we cannot help to look at another spectrum in terms of reality. In fact, I think about this subject when I listen to Philip's World Bank presentation. This is about um, education. Because um, a few weeks back, uh, World Bank in Thailand presented a work on Thailand economic report. And they have a good study conducting about the um, 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 problem of the low fertility reduced to a, a large number of small schools in Thailand have to close down. Uh, over 30,000 schools in Thailand, about 5,000 of them are very small schools, like uh, 50 students only. So you're talking about ability to provide good education for younger generation when you're talking about aging. And that's really, we are talking about reduction of poverty and increased social protection here in reality. We talk a lot about um, um, health care, pension, long-term care, but in terms of human capital development and investment on young people. Also, this country, Thailand, is aging really fast, but yet when you look at the young people, teenagers, this is also the country in which we have very high level of teen pregnancy, for example. Education of a, a young generation, it's also um, uh, caused by very large uh, uh, inequality in the society. So I wonder whether you have any comment to add to this uh, issue about quality of education as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Vanessa, would you like to go first? the question, I was asked to give a short answer. Private sector providing pensions, I think it needs a, a good financial sector development, which is not there in many countries. But for those countries with a good financial sector development, yes, it can be an option in addition. Um, I would say generally in this region, um, at the upper end, even in the rich countries, private pension penetration has been much lower than other so it doesn't seem to have taken off very well in, in Asia to date, relative to other parts of the world. Um, and then if you look globally at long-term care, long-term care insurance coverage globally is less than 2% private long-term care insurance, even in OECD countries. And I think the highest are the US and maybe Japan, France. Uh, but even those only go up to 4 or 5% or something. Basically, it's tiny. So that there's a real, there's a clear market failure on the care side, and I think pricing is a, is a really difficult problem there. Um, even the private side, where you should be able to price better, uh, there doesn't seem to be much penetration. Informal ones, people like Sailor in India and stuff, have internalised that market, and I think done it very effectively. But they've struggled to spread the model beyond the micro. Oh, 
uh, we running all the time and I need to appreciate you, I mean, the discussion is later, having a discussion later. So now I would like to close the sessions. Thank you all four speakers for your wonderful presentations. And thanks to the audience for giving challenging questions and suggestions. And please give big hands to our speakers. Thank <laughs> you.